All right, welcome everyone to the psychology breakout room. And um, you guys might know me already. I'm May Wynn, school psychologist for the State Assessment Center at California School for the Blind. And Elise, I wanted to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself a little bit. I so appreciate you joining us. No problem. So hello, my name is Elise Glamour. I'm a school psychologist with the Diagnostic Center South. And I'm happy to be here. Great. And um, so what I would like to start with today is what are some of your favorite assessment tools? Anyone? I, you, want me to, I, you want me to start, May? I, I can get it started and then maybe that'll okay. help everyone else become more comfortable. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. And I just realized that I have two screens on and I want to make sure I'm recording the right screen. Oh, okay. Well, we'll wait. Yeah, let's see. I'm not sure if I can well, tell. I, what we see is your um, your screen where you have psychoeducational assessments. It looks okay. like you notes. Know, like, and then I can see the little red dot blinking okay, in the great. upper left corner. So Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you. So hopefully I'm recording the right screen, but if not, <laughs> at least we'll have the audio. <laughs> All right. So why don't you go ahead, Elise, share with um, us some of your favorites. Well, my all-time favorite assessment is the Southern California Ordinal Scales of Development <laughs> because I love the uh, just the fluidity of it and just, you know, the... Um, the freedom that you have to kind of use materials that are that are of interest to the student. But then I love all of my standardized batteries as well. Um, and to say I had one favorite, I don't know if I could say that. I, I really like them all. Um, and so, but I think for norm reference assessment, it would definitely be the ordinal scales. Cool. And um, I believe that you're using the ordinal scales now, even though you're doing testing remotely, right? Yes, I am. All righty. And so um, right now in the chat, I'm going to put in the link to our shared Google Doc. And so everyone can type in there as we go. And I'm going to link the ordinal scales. But Elise, I'm going to stop sharing right now so that you can go ahead and share your screen. Um, oh, OK. Mm -hmm. All righty. Show us what you're doing with the ordinal scales. It's pretty cool. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. So I'm so happy to be here. And, you know, all that's going on in the world with the global pandemic has really um, challenged us to become more creative and think outside the box. And that's why it's so important that we don't get locked onto one assessment, but that we have a lot of assessments and different ways of figuring out a student's strengths and weaknesses that we don't get locked into one procedure or one way of doing things, right? Because when the whole world shut down, we all had to pivot. And so initially for us at the Diagnostic Center, it wasn't so bad because they had us just doing projects and kind of um, making our trainings more pretty and everything. But that can only last for so long, right? Our job is to support school districts and assess students. So then we all had to figure out how we're going to do that. And for me, I was really inspired by seeing the things that my son's teachers were doing. And so I have two sons, one is in first grade and one is in sixth grade. And the first grader, his teachers were creating all of these wonderful activities on um, this platform called Seesaw. So I was like, hmm, what is that? And then when they told us that we were going to start assessing, I'm like, okay, I have to figure out, you know, rating scales and record review that can give you a lot of rich information. But sometimes you want to have direct interactions with the student to see what they can do. So I had to think, okay, Elise, how could I do this? And like I said, I was really inspired by um, 
what my son's teachers were doing. And then I love the ordinal scales, right? Because the ordinal scales of development um, cognition is based on Piaget's theory. And that's like my first husband. So I'm <laughs> like, how can I incorporate my man into this, you know, bring him into the times, right? Um, into this technological age. And at the center, they weren't really comfortable with us yet doing more like virtual standardized assessments. And that's why really understanding norm referenced assessments and how to use them really come in handy because you're not bound to standardization. So you can use different materials and present the, um, the activities in all different types of ways. So I'm like, okay, at least I'm in the shower. I'm like, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna like present these activities to students? And this is what I came up with. So just, you know, I'm a very communicative person. So I'm always talking to people. So between what I saw my students, te my son's teachers doing it on Seesaw. And then I was talking to another friend of mine who's a preschool special education teacher. And she was telling me that she was using something called Boom Cards. So I kind of explored these two platforms and was able to recreate a majority of the tasks that we would present um, when we're administering the ordinal scales in person in Seesaw and Boom Cards. And I'm happy to share that with you. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the ordinal scales of development, but it is basically an assessment where you, um, like I said, it's norm reference and you are basically presenting Piagetian task. So I, what I did was I recreated a lot of those tasks and in the, um, the assessment, there are basically three kind of scales or categories, um, domains or whatever you would like to refer to them as. And so they are uh, reasoning and logic, classification and problem solving. The names are kind of different in the manual, but those are basically the skills that it hits. So I um, broke what I did down into, let me go back and show you into those three areas. And I started with sensory motor five. So for problem solving in sensory motor five, um, it starts with trial and error reasoning. And so uh, when you administer it, you would give the student a form board puzzle and the shapes, and you're supposed to be looking at the process that they use to solve the puzzle. So are they able to use foresight, which would be a skill in sensory motor six, where they're able to look at the piece, look at the puzzle, and in their mind, right, mentally anticipate where the puzzle should go, where the piece should go, and put it in the correct spot on the puzzle, or are they using trial and error? So, what I've been able to do is with the support of parents to some extent, because they might need to kind of help the student um, open up the boom deck or share the screen with me so that I can see. But what they're basically gonna do is put the pieces either through trial and error, right? Or foresight in the correct space on the puzzle. And while Elise is demonstrating that, just wondering if anyone has done any work with the Southern Ordinal Scales that um, Elise was mentioning earlier or familiar with PHA and TAS, or is this all new? Feel free to throw that in the chat so um, we know if like you might need some extra explanations. All new and new, oh great. So Elise, feel oh, free okay. to. Add more I'll description talk a little bit more about it as I go. So the ordinal scales was actually developed at the di by the diagnostic centers, and so this um, this next skill here is really kind of the next step to the form board puzzle, where you're looking at their ability to discriminate size. And so this is how I recreated a nesting activity. So they're supposed to put 
it in from biggest to smallest. So like how kids would have the little nesting cups that you would give them. This is my version of that in boom cards. And this skill is in um, pre-op one. So um, basically Piaget's theory of the, and then this is the next higher skill that would be stacking. So like the little stacking rings that you would give kids or that you see kids play with the toy where it's like on the yellow little uh, spindle and then they put the rings on so that they're supposed to put them in order of size. When you do it with live objects, the stacking rings is a higher skill than the nesting cups because when you're nesting with cups, you get kind of feedback. It doesn't fit, so you know it's wrong. But when you have stacking rings, they all of them fit on top of each other. So it's uh, this would be a higher level skill. But so they're supposed to stack them on top of each other and put them in size order. Oh. And then um, within the problem solving domain, we also start to look at their understanding of quantity. So they're supposed to demonstrate understanding of less and more. So this is kind of my version of that. And you're gonna wanna do the activity a couple of times um, just to make sure that the skill is consistent and they're not guessing. And then this is also another version of less and more. And the, this right here is a reproducible that's actually in the scales manual. So I like had to scan them and then copy and cut and paste them in. But you're seeing if they could match the single and double dot cards to demonstrate their understanding of less and more to you. And I think that you could do this like four times or some two times or something like that. I don't exactly remember. Okay, so then after we're looking at your understanding of less or more, we move into kind of higher level problem solving. Um, and when we move past like our perception of size through nesting and stacking, we start to seriate and that's our understanding of like order, right? Our ability to look at something and figure out what order, how could we bring order to this? So that's what those little, we all have seen the little dolls, right? That are of graduated sizes. So I found a picture of them online. And I like, we have, a, we're luckily we have some pretty cool technology. So we have a program called Snag It where you can like grab a piece of a picture online. So that would be that. So they're supposed to put them in order. And then there are these little rods. So this would be like an example of a Cuisinart rods, like the little sticks that are of different sizes. So I had to kind of recreate that. Okay, so then also, um, once we go from less understanding less and more, we start to understand that numbers represent quantities. So uh, a uh, activity that we do as a part of the skills is looking at one-to-one -one correspondence, right? Because this is all tied into math and reading and all of these things. This is such a useful tool because a lot of these skills have a direct a direct correlation with academics, right? So your ability to seriate and understand order ties into, can you sequence a story? Can you understand how events follow a particular order? One-to-one -one correspondence is linked into like being able to do math, right? Beyond just having a rote, rote memorization of two plus two equals four, but understanding if you take two things and two things that that equals four. Also when you're reading, right? You have to have one-to-one -one correspondence to understand that letters represent sounds and all of these things. So even though I'm not doing standardized assessment, I'm still able to use these Piagetian tasks to get a lot of useful information. So what you're supposed to demonstrate one-to-one -one correspondence. Some green chips. So I created a video. Chips. The blue chips are yours and the green chips are mine. So in this Watch video, I'm kind of demonstrating. My chips. 
So I'm moving my chips and I make a row. I don't know, it's kind of blurry, but you can see. Now use your chips to make one like mine. Make one right here. Okay. And remember, so they're supposed to make their row like mine. So then what I want them to do is grab their chips and make a row like mine. So they're supposed to use exact the, the exact same number of chips, but there are a few extra chips. Right, so I know that if they can make it look like mine, there's one-to-one -one correspondence, then they have the skill. But if they were to like go back and try to squeeze in all of the chips or start making another row underneath it, then they don't have the skill, right? Okay. Whoops. I don't know. Whoops. Okay, let me move on to the next. Something must be wrong with the way I programmed that one. So in the scales, you're supposed to do the activity more than once. So that's why I have it again here. Then the next skill after that would be conservation, right? So my understanding that just because the way something is presented changes doesn't mean that the essence of it changes. So with the chips, yeah, they're lined up, they're the same, but if I move the chips around into a different orientation, it's still the same, right? I haven't added any and I haven't taken any away. And so this is an important skill to assess because okay, conservation so is what again. allows us to understand that chips. a letter can Here make more than one chips. sound. We have that, the same amount of green chips. Let me mute this. That, um, that just five plus six is the same as six plus five, right? When we don't have one-to-one -one course, I mean, when we don't have conservation, excuse me, then to us, that would be two different math problems, but we all have conservation. So we know that five plus six is the same as six plus five. So like I said, these skills are highly linked to academics. So what I want to do is present them with this and then I'm gonna ask them, are there more blue chips, more green chips or the same amount of chips, right? And when I say this, I'm always gonna say, are they the same? Because if I just give you more green chips or more blue chips, then I'm suggesting that there has to be one or the other. And so we do this a couple of times and I switch the order. You see the order of the um, options is different. And then the next skill, conservation is kind of a developmental skill. So we look at conservation of number, conservation of liquid, and conservation of mass. So here I found these videos of people doing conservation activities with kids, and I just use that to present it. Then I'm like, okay, does the man have more? Does the boy have more? Do they have the same? Um, and then here's for math. So it's like two balls and then the man flattens one and it's like, okay, do I have more clay? Do you have more clay or do we have the same amount of clay? Okay, so then we also start to answer. In problem solving, we start to look at like our multivariable reasoning. And so there are these cards here of different colors and different shapes and they're just supposed to basically take the cards and um, reason with both color and shape at the same time to uh, make a little picture grid like this. I'll just quickly do it to show you. Okay, so here we're looking at multivariable reasoning, which is important for like, you know, activities of daily living. Can you like walk on the street and talk to someone and watch out for cars at the same time? So all of these things are linked to academics and life skills. And then this is just a higher form of, of seriation because we move past like objects to line drawings and representational drawings. So here I would want them to kind of put these pictures in size order like this. And then they do it 
with colors, with these uh, line drawings, so it gets a little more difficult, and then with dots. And then, you know, once we move into those last things, we're like in pre-op pre -op one and pre-op two. Um, but now when we get into like concrete, then if you notice, everything becomes more abstract. Um, so now they're seriating with actual words. So if this person is taller than this person, but shorter than this person, who's the tallest? So I kind of put it in there and then you can type in the answer and then you ask them, how do they know? Okay. Yeah, so, all righty. So I'm going to leave out of this one. Any questions so far? So we had some questions in the chat as you're going, Elise. So um, mm -hmm. I'll just go over them. So some people are asking, uh, where's what's that resource? Where can I get it? And just in case you came in a little bit later um, to our breakout room. So Elise is demonstrating PJ and TAS and um, the Southern California Diagnostic Center created the Southern California Ordinal Skills of Development. And she, when you order the um, manual or kit, uh, it is not what you see Elise is doing. That's all her awesome work. It's her wonderful creation that she spent, I believe, probably many hours creating. Um, so you wouldn't be purchasing this online format. She created this based on PGA and theory and the format from the ordinal scales. And so I put in the chat the links to order the manual or the kit and okay. a you put it guidebook. In, was it mm -hmm. Zillprint? Yes, yes, that okay. one. Mm -hmm. And then there's a guidebook um, that you can preview about 33 pages of it on Google. And I dropped that in the link as well. And that was published in 2018, so more recent publication. Um, and then another question was, what's the age range? So this isn't a standardized assessment. So it's not like somewhere it's like, okay, if you're age two or three, you need to start at this point or things like that. You, you can use it with young children. Like I've, I've seen it used with, you know, um, preschool kids around two years old, and you can use it with older individuals as well who might be cognitively functioning in um, an early range. So if they have any cognitive delays, it might provide more meaningful data than a standardized assessment. Mm -hmm. And anything else you want to say about that, about the age so, range? You know, it, it's based on Piaget's theory. So his theory starts in the sensory motor stages of development. So by sensory motor, we mean like when we're at the stage where we need to touch and feel and we're learning through movement and exploration. Um, so it goes from birth the scale starts from sensory motor one, which is like zero to three months or zero to four months, something like that, up and through formal operations, which is where most adults function, but some, not everyone gets there. So it really spans the full lifespan. You can go from out the womb to adults as well. So, you know, a lot of it is, in the interpretation of the response or the quality of the response, not necessarily based on a right or wrong answer, but the quality of the response gives you indications of someone's developmental level. Well said, Elise. And I think if you're um, assessing a student with visual impairments, some of these tasks visually might be challenging um, just to, you know, kind of throw that out there. Um, and, uh, but how Elise mentioned how you would interpret, that's very important when you're looking at students with visual impairments as well. You want to be looking at how the student is accomplishing that task, how they're trying to problem solve, and that will give you really meaningful information for interventions or accommodations, which is, you know, the real meat of what we're trying to get at. Like, how right. are we going to help this student learn and be independent? Mm -hmm. All right, I'll, yeah. I'll let you take it away. <laughs> no, because I, I, I like that you said that because that's really what makes you worth your salt as a school psychologist. Anybody could be trained to read or follow a procedure, right? And then the statistical aspect of it is truly minimal as well because you just, you, if you can add, right, you can convert a raw score 
to a scaled score, but the interpretation is what makes you worth it. You know, that's where the meat of what we do is. And so that's why um, it's not based on the actual response, but the quality of the response. So now we're into, um, what scale is this that I just opened up? I'm sorry. Oh, classification. So classification starts with object concept, like object permanence, right? The understanding that objects exist or things exist outside of our direct interaction with them. So uh, one of the first activities in uh, sensory motor five is them finding a sequentially hidden object. So, um, oh, let me see. I didn't finish this one, I'm sorry. Uh, so what I did was I think, okay, I'm sorry, I was going through cause I, you know, I try it out and then sometimes things don't work. So I have to go back and, uh, <laughs> and rearrange how it's done. But the idea is that you would have an object and you take it and hide it between, um, behind these different things. And they're supposed to, um, remember where it was last hidden. So that's what these activities would be. So what I did when I um, had a student that I used this with before was I had a video of myself hiding the object. And then I had the object behind one of behind like the blue one. And so I'm like, okay, where is it? And then he was supposed to move it and find the object and the kid like target so I had the little, I used my snag it and I like snagged the little target logo because I knew that he would actually track that and um, he was able to find it. So that was pretty cool. Um, then after that, we move into matching, right? So matching color. So I have these here. So they're just supposed to move them and match. Then we go into matching shapes. And again, and I'll skip. Uh, matching objects. This kid liked keys. When I first, the first assessment that I did virtually, he liked keys, iPad, like um, Eggo waffles and he liked to drink. So that's why I have these matching activities. So it can be very, um, you can very, very much individualize it because, you know, he was uh, pretty impacted by autism, functioning in early stages of development and his attention span was very limited and he had, you know, really, there was a lot of avoidance and it had worked for him for a long time. So he didn't feel like he really had to do things that people asked him to do. So I wanted to make it interesting for him so that I know that I'm assessing his skills and not his non <laughs> not like his non-compliance. So that's why these are the objects that I'm using here. Um, so then, you know, from matching, matching evolves into sorting, right? Because remember I said this is classification, right? So you see the skills are becoming more sophisticated. So first sorting by color. So this is what you're gonna want them to do. Oh my gosh, my husband's alarm, sorry. Um, sorting by color and then by shape. So they're the same color, but two different shapes. Then next would be uh, sorting by representational property. So what things represent. Uh, okay, but when you actually use it, like when I do this in person, the things that I use are like food items and vehicles, but they're all primary colors. So the bus might be red, the plane might be blue. So when I was doing this, I wanted to kind of have, um, cause those are like distractors, right? Cause I really wanna really see if they're sorting by what they represent. So I tried to think of things like the orange and the tractor are both orange, right? To kind of throw them off to ensure that they're really sorting by the representational properties. 
like the trash truck is green, the broccoli is green, things like that. The car is red, the chicken is red. Um, so there are two groups, vehicles and food. Okay, and then this is um, like uh, basically looking at their ability to identify like what's missing. So like the um, leg of the chair is missing. So for here, I'll usually have them annotate if they can and draw in what's missing here, draw in the shoelaces or tell me, right? Because it's flexible here. Oh, but then we have to erase when we annotate, right? Okay. <laughs> Let me erase it, sorry. Okay, so then here they would, uh, like the wheel of the car is missing or the tire, the numbers on the telephone. I get a kick out of it. You can tell that the scales was created like in the 70s because a lot of kids are like, what is that? <laughs> They've never even seen that before, right? And then here um, would be, there are questions that you ask. And so we start to look at class inclusion. So right now we're in pre-op two or one, hold on. No. And pre-op, she means pre-operational. Oh, sorry, pre yes, pre-operational two. And so I'm gonna ask them, questions like, um, just one second. And while she's looking at these questions. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's, this is concrete. Go ahead, ma'am. I'm sorry oh. to cut you off. Oh, though. no, go ahead. Go ahead. If you found it, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so we're looking at their ability to classify. So you're going to ask them questions like, um, are there more big dogs than little ones? Are there more little more dogs than little ones? So do they understand that like little ones includes like little dogs, right? Uh, dogs includes not only the big dogs and the little dogs, right? But all of the dogs. If all the dogs in the world died, would there be any little dogs left? If all the big dogs in the world died, would there be any dogs left? They need to think of new questions because I've had a couple kids start crying like, all of the dogs in the world died. Okay, so that's when you know like, okay, you're not at this developmental level, right? Because you don't even understand that this is hypothetical. But anyway, yeah, so I'm like, I need to use maybe like roses or something like that, but I don't know. Okay. Um, and so sometimes you have to do that more than once because you know, they might get kind of tripped up on the wording or something like that. So I put it in twice. And then here, for this one, we are doing um, uh, the beginning of multiple class memberships. So you're looking at if they can consider like multiple attributes. Uh, so like you're looking at, I say like, oh, I have a puzzle, one piece is missing, which one of these pieces goes here? And so it would be this one. And then the same here. So there are three demo items. Because the nice thing is that with the skills you can teach you can explain, you can demo, you can go back and give it again because the idea is that it's developmental. So if you don't have it, you don't have it. Interestingly though, you know, when you work with kids sometimes, and I think that this is like one of the coolest experiences that I have is that as they reason through it, they come into knowing. So it's almost like you watch them jump a developmental level you know you see like the dissonance and they're like wait that doesn't make any sense um and then you see them kind of come into or evolve into understanding and that's really cool so with this one it would be that one would go there right and i've asked them why like oh because they're all uh, rectangles and they're all small right because there are other rectangles but those are big so that wouldn't be the answer and this they're all big and yellow 
So when you're actually doing the scales, you would be using attribute blocks. Um, now this, in the scale, in the manual for the scales, there is like a little um, template or, you know, uh, visuals for this item, but they're shapes. So I don't know if you guys can see, it looks like this, but I do the scales training and um, a lot of times because it's so rich, people will come to the scales training more than once. So there was someone that came that had uh, done this training before when I did it in Ventura la the last year. And she told me how she recreated it with like pictures because she thought that it would be more interesting for the kids. And I was like, oh, okay. So this kind of piggybacks on the, uh, on the skill that we saw before with the attribute blocks. It's kind of the same because they have to look at the color and the shape, right? And so the same here. So this one would be the blue butterfly and the yellow um, flower. And okay. Elise, mm -hmm. we, um, are we running on time? Goes, this goes by so quickly. And oh I'm my God, sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. See, I no can go worries. on and on all day. How much more time uh, do we have? Um, technically, we're supposed to go back to the other room already, but let's stay here for a little bit because I do want to address the questions that are in um, the chat. So, okay. um, Lori asks, are you doing any online ornamental trainings? And Elise is working on creating some. So Elise, once you um, have that ready to go, um, I can share it out on um, through Braille and Teach or something so that our uh, TBI colleagues can join in your training if they're interested. Definitely. Um, so yeah, I'm working on that now. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm putting it together. The training is two days. So I'm breaking it down into modules. So it's gonna be probably like about 10 to 12 modules. And I think it'll be like a recorded webinar. So you'll just do it at your pace. Um, and then I'll just quickly go, these are like the logic and reasoning. So you're asking them these questions, these phenomenon questions. And then um, there's also like on the scales, there's like some experimentation where you do sink and float, but I really haven't yet figured out how to, I've done it just kind of live with the kids, with me having the materials here. I haven't figured out how to put it in boom cards. So that's pretty much the boom cards that I created. And then I'll just quickly show you Seesaw. So can you see my Seesaw page now? Yes. Okay, so in Seesaw, I have a lot of the same task the platform is just different so oh uh, we didn't see this but this is like describing pictures so they're supposed to like look at these pictures that i have and tell me about them so this is where we start to look at like la the beginning of language and symbolic language attachment and things like that um i've just found that with uh Seesaw, I've used it more like with older kids because when you have the actual um, items to move, like to sort, they can resize. You can't really lock the size, so it gets kind of confusing. And a lot of times the earlier developing kids have lower frustration tolerance, so they get a little frustrated. Um, even though I kind of like Seesaw better, I've just found that boom cards. And then with boom cards, you know, you get the little ding. So it gives you the feedback. So that's motivating as well. So I'll usually use that with like my, you know, or late sensory motor, early uh, pre-op kids. And then with the older, later pre-op concrete kids use um, Seesaw. Okay, sorry, May. Sorry that I took up all the time. No, it's great. and. There's, um, you probably can't see the chat since you're sharing screen, but people are saying, oh, this is awesome, Elise. Thank you for sharing. And um, there was a question about an example report or template using this type of assessment with a student with VI. And I just want to put it out there uh, for those of you who might not be as familiar with students with visual impairments. There's no like one set type of student with visual impairments. There's such a wide range of presentations in terms of 
their functioning levels and their various impairments that they might have to uh, find out how to accommodate and work with. So particularly with this assessment too, it's not like you're gonna be giving all the subtests or like how you might with a standardized assessment, you can pick and choose your tasks and you might mm -hmm. delve more into one area depending on his student response. So it's really hard to say like, oh, there's a template way of doing this or there's a template way of writing it up. Um, you might wanna write it up based on the different um, areas that the student might have mastered or de demonstrated emerging understanding, but it's not like, you know, the WISC or the DOS where you can just like have a template with all the score charts and uh, little descriptions of each task. It's, uh, it's harder to write up, but it can be so much more meaningful for students who might not respond as well to standardized assessments. I mean, at, at this stage, I don't really use templates for my standardized assessments either because if we're doing it in a way that's really useful, you know, it should be maybe like a standardized statement about what a skill is, you know, oh, fluid reasoning is this or crystallized abilities mean this. But as far as the report, every kid is so different. So I don't even have really templates for that. Um, when in the skills training, when you, if you sign up for it, you receive a manual. And so there are some sample write-ups. And then if you purchase the book that may uh, has in the link to, I can't think of the name of it, but the, the interpretation, guy. yes. Mm -hmm. There are some write-ups in, I think that that really was kind of the revision. There are some sample write-ups in there. And that book is like a Bible for the ordinal scales. Yes. <laughs> so and if you're interested in it, you should. When we have kids that come to the center, very rarely do we get them because you, you know, may, you, your team exists. But when we do have kids with visual impairments, we might use like, it'll be like maybe just mild. So we might just use like high contrast materials and things of that sort to support them or um, more realistic. I, we might use like real items for sorting by representational properties than, you know, little uh, toys and things of that sort. Like, but um, that would be about the extent of what we do at the center. And Elise, I really appreciate how you talked about um, like not using a standardized way, like templating your reports. That kind of leads right nicely into what I wanted to mention real quick before we go back to the main room. Um, Elise, do you mind if I take over screen share? Go ahead. Let me stop sharing. Thank you. And here we go. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about assessment, um, psychoeducational assessment for students with visual impairments. And uh, are you able to see the Google Doc, the psych FAQ? Yep, yeah. all right, thank you yeah. for your feedback. Yeah. And if you're in Google Doc, just to let you know, there's this outline, um, little icon on the left hand top side. And then if you use headings correctly, you can use it to kind of go through um, a document easily. Um, but when a lot, a big question that I get <laughs> is what test can I use with a student who is blind or visually impaired? And I gave a little blurb about things to keep in mind when you're assessing, but one of the most important things I want you to keep in mind is that to really emphasize the validity and interpretation of the report, like think beyond just the scores, because a lot of times these tests are not normed on students with visual impairments and the spectrum of students with visual impairments is so wide and it's such a low incidence population that it is really hard to norm a test for students with visual impairments. And so I provided this guidance document link um, actually a former uh, Stefan Goodman, he used to be at CSB at the California School for the Blind and he had colleagues from the Texas School for the Blind and um, others, you can read more about it. But this is a wonderful guidance document of what you need to keep in mind when you are um, assessing a student with visual impairments. It's really important, like Elise and I mentioned earlier, to think about um, 
you know, what is the student's performance telling you about what kind of accommodations or what kind of strategies might be helpful for them? Um, and to focus less on the scores, because sometimes you might not want to report the scores. It might be more meaningful to report their performance qualitatively. And we're running out of time. We should have joined the main group a long time ago. So there's a lot more details, but please, 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 if you have a student that has visual impairments, check this document out before you start. And if you use a cross battery type of assessment, um, these are some different subtests that you might check out in building your battery. Um, but please do not just go to these charts to look at tests. Please read this little explanation above because that's the really core part is how you interpret it. And you really want to see, you know, are you presenting the information in a way that is meaningful to the student? You might have to accommodate or modify how you present the test. So your TVI is really going to be your best friend <laughs> when you assess a student with visual impairments. And that's a teacher of students with visual impairments. She's going to let you know, or he's going to let you know, what is the student's primary um, learning media and what is their level of functional vision and let you know how to best accommodate or what is needed so that you're you're really testing the skill area and you're not just testing the impact level of the visual impairment, if that makes sense. That is such a good, can I just say one more thing, May? And that, that's like a good point with any student that is outside the box. I mean, we're special educators, so all students are different anyway, <laughs> but really considering what is this skill measuring? And then that leads into how we can accommodate and modify things for this student. Because if we don't have a good idea of the essence of what the item is getting at, then you don't know where to go. So that is like kind of the foundation, I think, of accommodation and modifications. What, what am I trying to assess? What do I want to know what they can do? What and am I I'll, looking for? Oh, thank you, Elise. Thank you. And yes, yeah, so I'll link this document and the other document in our main group document here. But let's join the main room that we were supposed to join a while ago. So if you could please leave the breakout room and go back to the main room. Thank you so much for coming to our psych room.